Right. Okay. We are um, learning Sanhedrin. Let's get the Gemara up on the screen straight away. Uh, there it is. Let me know when you've got it. Okay. Okay. Right. There we go. Um, so, um, we left off last time um, over here. We just started this a little bit. We need to go back to the Mishnah. So we'll take you back to page nine. Um, we were talking about what things are required. No, what things require 71 judges uh, in order to achieve them. And we talked about, we spent quite some time talking about the war. You don't go out to war. And we talked about the Sanhedrin being involved in the discussion about whether you go out to war. We brought some proofs from David HaMelech. And we finished that. And we ended up the last year by starting uh, this section here. Ein mosifin al ha'ir va'al ha'azarot ela al pi beit din shel shivim be'echa. You can only extend the boundary of the city of Jerusalem and of the courtyard of the temple if you have a bet din of 71, the Sanhedrin. And we explained uh, last time, I'm going to take you back to the Gemara now, that's the Mishnah that we've just seen. Here we are back in the Mishnah, in the Gemara. We explained last time that what we're talking about here um, is very important in terms of the Korbanot, because the Korbanot have a set time that you can eat them, um, and a set place where you can eat them. Uh, if you don't eat them in the right uh, time, it's called notar. It's called, um, notar means it's superfluous. It's gone over the time. Um, and it's almost like it's expired. The time has expired. You know, it's like the sell-by date. Uh, uh, if you, you've got it, you've only got one day and one night for certain uh, korbanot. Some korbanot you've got two nights and one day. It depends on the korban, but you've got you've got a set time for the um, for the korbanot to be eaten. There's also a set place where they can be eaten. Some korbanot can only be eaten inside the azara, inside the courtyard of the temple. Others can be eaten in the whole of the city of Jerusalem. And then you've got certain korbanot can only be eaten by different people. So certain things can only be eaten by Kohanim. Other parts of the korban and different korbanot can be eaten by the owners who are not Kohanim. So when it comes to uh, sacrifices, there's all sorts of different parameters that we have to apply. Time, space, and person. What we're talking about here is space. Um, so if there are korbanot, which can only be eaten in the city of Jerusalem, which there are, then we need to know what constitutes the city of Jerusalem. As I explained to you last time, for example, Natanya is the longest city in Israel. It extends all the way from, into the, from the north uh, uh, as far as, um, as Kfar Vatikin, and then it goes all the way down in the south as far as Wingate, and that's all considered Natanya. Well, it didn't used to be like that, did it? It used to be a tiny little place, just the, the Merkaz of Natanya, the centre of Natanya, in the early, 19, uh, early, early 20th century when Natanya was first established. Um, it was just a few little buildings. And then it's gradually got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's how cities evolve. But when it comes to Jerusalem, you've got the added problem of this Kedusha, this holiness, which is conferred upon Jerusalem and uh, which allows the korbanot to be eaten there. Um, so it was not walled in those days, Johnny. Was it not walled in those it, days? It was walled, but you can you can you can um, you can move the walls, can't you? Yeah. Uh, you know, you build if you need to build a more city, you'll build outside the walls 
And then you build another set of walls around it, and then you knock down the first lot of walls. So one way or another, you're extending the city. So with Jerusalem, it, you can't just do that willy-nilly because of the Kedusha. You have to have uh, the 71 uh, uh, man bet din. Same for the uh, Azara. Now, the, the original courtyard of the first Bet Amikdash was much was determined by certain uh, factors. Herod in the second temple expanded the temple and expanded the courtyard. Um, so uh, again, we've got, to, according to the, the Mishnah, you have to have 71 judges. If you have a look on the screen here, on the left-hand side, uh, where my pointer is, uh, Rav Steinsaltz tells us that actually um, it wasn't just the 71-man court that was required. It was the same as the war situation. You needed the king, the Sanhedrin, and the Urim Batumim. This was, you know, a massive issue. You needed the same uh, um, requirements as you have for going out to war. It's that important. So, um, that's what the Mishnah says. The Mishnah tells us that you cannot uh, extend the city or extend the courtyards without the 71-man Sanhedrin. That's uh, what the Mishnah said. We now come back to the Gemara and we say, our favourite question, how do you know? From where do you derive your scriptural proof? Says the Gemara, I want a scriptural proof. It's all very well you saying that, but... How do you know? And Rashimi Barchia suggests a source, a scriptural source for this halacha. Amakra, the verse says, Kachol asher ani mare otcha et tavnit amishkan vechein taasu. Let's go straight to the Pasuk. It's in um, Sefer Shemot. I will put it on the screen for you uh, now. Um, one second. Struggling here a second, one minute. There we go. Um, get rid of that. Share the screen. There we go. Right, you should have Shemot chapter 25, verse 9. Um, and uh, you'll have a look at there. It says uh, over here, we're talking, well, let's just go back a few, um, a few verses. It's right at the beginning of Parshat Teruma. As you can see there, there's the, the word Truma. Um, Hashem says to Moses, speak to the children of Israel, get them to take a Truma, an offering, and this is what you should take, gold, silver, copper, etc. All of these things, blue, purple, all these walls, all the materials that you need. And Jeffrey, verse 8, please, off the screen. And they shall make me a sanctuary and I'll dwell in their midst. Midst. Keep going, keep going. According to all that I show you, the pattern of the Mishkan and the pattern of all its vessels, and so shall you do. Okay, so what we have here is um, a very subtle uh, superfluity, a very subtle excess of words. See if you can spot it. Without, before we go back to the Mishnah, uh, well, back to the Gemara. What is the Gemara going to get its, itself excited about in those two psukim that uh, it, it, it can use as a derivation for our law that we're trying to prove? So all that I show you, and then so shall you do. All right. Okay. Let me 
Maybe that means that you can alter it. Okay, very Maybe. good, Johnny. Very good. So it says in verse eight, "Va'atu li mikdash." They shall make me a sanctuary. Meaning, who the Bnei Yisrael? This is after the uh, Egel Azahav, according to most opinions, anyway. And Hashem says, "Right, you need to make for me a sanctuary." And I will dwell in their midst. So, you shall make me, or they actually, in the, they shall make for me a mikdash. How shall they make it? Verse 9. According to all that I show you, the pattern of the Mishkan and the pattern of all its vessels. That's how they're going to make it. I will show you how they should make it, says Hashem. And then, as Johnny points out, it says, V'chein ta'asu, and so shall um, they do. So shall they do. Now, if the pasuk was to stop over here, and this bit was not there, and it just said, the two verses read, they shall make me a sanctuary, and I will dwell in their midst, according to all that I show you, the pattern of the Mishkan and the pattern of all its vessels. You would not say, well, why doesn't it say V'chein Ta'asu? Because it's already said, they shall make me a sanctuary. They shall make me a sanctuary according to all that I shall show you. Why do you need this bit? V'chein Ta'asu, and so you shall do. That is superfluous. You don't need that, those two words, which mean that, in that pasuk. That is extra. So the uh, Gemara quickly jumps on that uh, superfluous uh, paragraph, that superfluous two words, and learns something from it. So let's go back to the Mishnah. I meant the Gemara, not the Mishnah. There we go. Let's go to the Gemara. There it is. So the Pasuk says, Rabbi Shimi Bachia quotes that Pasuk and it says, <laughs> What does it mean, tasu? What does that extra bit mean? Says Rab Shimi, Rab Shimi Bachia, La Dorot Ha Ba'in. It means for future generations. Okay, what does that mean? Future generations. There's only going to be one Mishkan. Why would the future generations be making a Mishkan? What's that got to do with the future generations? It's for the temples. Yes, it's for the temples. The Bet HaMikdash was the replacement for the Mishkan. So... Says Rav Shimi Barachia, the fact that it says V'chein Ta'asu, and so you shall do, means, and so you shall do exactly the same when you make your next Mishkan, i.e. the Bet HaMikdash. And when you make the one after that, the second Bet HaMikdash. And when you make the one after that, the third Bet HaMikdash, Bezrat Hashem. So this expression, V'chein Ta'asu, refers to the later generations, the Dorot Haba'in, the generations Haba'in that are coming, i.e. future generations. The future generations. That's what we learn from V'chein Ta'asu. Okay, big deal. How does that help us? How does that help us? We're trying to prove that you need 71 judges in order to uh, extend the city and to extend the tabernacle, eh, to extend the azara, the courtyard. How does this extra two words, meaning that what uh, the, the, the making of the vessels is according to what Hashem showed Moshe, how does that help us? What's the logic there? I think so you shall do in the future when you've got permission when you've got permission to do it, you can't just change the laws just like that. All right. So, so how did... Otherwise, we might be changing them today with it. 
how did Moshe in 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 this in our, when he was making the Mishkan, um, how how did the vessels in the Mishkan get made? Were there not measurements given in it, sir? I can't remember. We're told, yeah, you should make this, that, and the other. But how did they know what to make? Who told them? It says a kiyosh shel nechoshet, or something like that. Yeah. And, and, okay, so Betzalel was the one that made all the things, right? How did he know? Who told him what to do? Moshe. Moshe, okay. Moshe told him what to do. Who told Moshe what to do? Moshe. Good. Okay. We know, don't we, because we've done this before, that Moshe is the equivalent of the Sanhedrin Hagadol. Moshe stands in place, as it says over here, Moshe stands in place of the great Sanhedrin. So the logic is this. If in the first Mishkan, they only made things on the instruction of Moshe, then when it comes to the future generations, because of these words, v'chein ta'asu, anything that wanted to be altered in future generations to make it different. So, for example, if you wanted to make the ark differently, you couldn't, unless the Sanhedrin gave you permission, because the Sanhedrin is in place of Moshe, and Betzalel had to do exactly what Moshe told him to do. And Moshe had to tell him to do exactly what Hashem had told him to do. But the point is that Moshe and the Sanhedrin are equivalent. So in future generations, if we prove from our verse here, the Tasu, if we prove that that refers to the future generations, then we can understand that future generations have no permission to change anything about the Bet HaMikdash, including the uh, dimensions of the courtyard, including the extent of the city where the Korbanot, which are part of the Mishkan's whole process, are eaten. That is not allowed to be changed without Moshe say so. Moshe's not here. And so in place of Moshe, we have the, um, the Sanhedrin. So we've now proved, according to um, Rav Shimi Bar Chia, this is our scriptural proof for the fact that you cannot add on to the city or the courtyard without the Sanhedrin's approval. Does that make sense? Yeah, the log you can understand the logic to that. Okay, great. The only problem is that the Gemara doesn't like it. The Gemara is going to raise an objection. OK, um, so I rather liked that. I thought that was very good logic. Um, the problem is that Rava knows a thing or two about um, Mishnah and Brighter, and he quotes a Brighter that I was not aware of. And neither was anybody else until he brought it in this Gemara, because that's the whole point about a Brighter, isn't it? It wasn't ri written down. Only the Mishnah was written down. Brighter was the stuff that got left on the cutting room floor, but is still important. So, Metiv Rava. Rava asks a question, raises an objection, and he brings us a Brighter. And this Brighter says, Kol hakelim she'asa Moshe. All the vessels, meaning all the vessels in the Mishkan, that Moshe made. Wait a minute. He didn't make them. Who made them? Salel. The Salel. So, okay. He doesn't mean that Moshe made them with his hands. Which ones did Moshe make? Sort of. There was one of the Kalim in the Mishkan that Betzalel couldn't do. So Moshe tried to do it, and he couldn't do it either. And in the end, Hashem made it. Was it the candelabra? The it was indeed the candelabra, the menorah. Um, the uh, Midrash tells us that 
Hashem showed him the picture of the uh, uh, menorah. Of course, it had to be beaten out by from one solid block of gold with all its flowers and its rimonim and all the bits and kaftorim and all the stuff that was on it. It's a complicated thing. But Talel couldn't do it. Moshe couldn't do it. And in the end, the Midrash says uh, they threw this uh, this thing in a fire and uh, and out came the menorah uh, that Hashem made it. But anyway, so when it says She'asa Moshe, it doesn't mean that Moshe made them himself. It means that they were made under Moshe's instructions. In other words, the original Kalim that Betzalel and his co-workers made. Um, so all of those vessels in the Mishkan, so we're talking about the original vessels in the Mishkan, the original Shulchan, the original um, Kior, uh, the, the, the bowl, the original altars, the original um, menorah, all of those things. Meshichatan Mekadshan. They become consecrated. You see the word Kodesh in there, yeah? They become consecrated for use by Meshichatan. What's the root of that word? It's the anointing, like Mashiach. The... Mashiach, that is the root of the word. Mashiach, meaning, what is Mashiach? Ano the anointed one. The anointed one, yes, the Messiah. Okay. Um, there are those that believe that the Messiah has been. Uh, and of course, we believe that he wasn't the Messiah. He was just a very naughty boy, um, to quote the life of Brian. Uh, the consecration of these vessels, in other words, before they could be used in order for them to become uh, holy and to be used for a holy purpose, they had to be anointed. Their anointment. Um, is what made them holy. That's what that literally means. Their anointment made them holy. In other words, they could not be used until they were anointed. What were they anointed with? Oil. Oil. Yeah, oil. what kind of oil? So it's a sacred oil, holy oil. Yeah, sacred holy oil. Um, and so um, the question here. And this is what the Brysa um, um, comments on. Mikan ve'elach, from here onwards, meaning any time after the Mishkan, from here onwards, avodatan mechanchetan. Their usage is what um, consecrates them. It's another word for consecration. What word can you see in the middle of there? Enoch, Enoch. Enoch, yes. Hanukkah. Hanukkah. Dedication. Dedication. Hanukkah Tabayit is a dedication of the house. So their dedication was not done through anointing. This is the future, Mikan Va'elech. From here on in, in other words, anything after the vessels of the Mishkan, from here on in, they were not consecrated by anointment. They were consecrated by usage. In other words, the mere fact that you used the menorah or the shulchan, the table, or the kior, the, the basin, or the altar, whatever it is, the mere fact that you used it in the holy service, that in and of itself is the dedication of that vessel. You don't need the oil. Why not, do you think? Maybe they didn't have the holy oil anymore. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I have no idea, but I, what, what the Brysa doesn't give us a reason. But I'm sure that's right, Johnny, because yeah. if you say that you can't use this vessel until you've got holy oil anointed, what if you haven't got any holy oil? Mm. Then you're right, you're in right, Stuch. So I think it's a practical brighter, it's a brighter of practical uh, consequence that from here on, on onwards, the mere fact that you use these vessels is sufficient 
to uh, consecrate them for service. Okay. Vamai. And why? Hang on a minute. Um, so uh, we, we've got a question. We've just said, Neymar v'chein ta'asu. We've now seemed to have a question. This brysa seems to contradict what we just said. We just said v'chein ta'asu is for the coming generation. So anything that we've just said about the vessels of the Mishkan goes for the vessels of the future temples. But now this brysa that Rava has found contradicts that, doesn't it? Because it's not the same. The vessels in the Mishkan needed oil. The vessels in the temple did not need oil. They just needed to be used. So at this point, if we stop the Gomorrah here, we're now no, we're no better off, are we? We now don't know why. Remember what we're trying to prove here. We're trying to prove that we need a 71-man bet din to uh, expand the, the temple. And we said the scriptural source for that was this v'chein ta'asu. The coming generations is the same as the previous generation with the Mishkan. In the previous generation, you needed Moshe. We don't have Moshe anymore. Moshe is the equivalent of the 71. So up till Rava comes mixing in, we were fine. We had a, a, we had a good proof. Rava comes along and says, no, your proof's not good because I've got a brysa that shows that's not the case. It's not the case that the future uh, uh, temple is entirely comparable to the old Mishkan because in the old Mishkan, you needed anointing of the vessels to get them going, as it were, to be consecrated. And in the temple, you didn't. So your proof doesn't work. So the Gemara comes back now, ping pong ball back, back, for, back and forth, says, nah, Rava, you're not right. This is a famous Gemara uh, expression. You'll see it very, very uh, many times. Shane In the first Cain Tasu, God says in the apostle before that, she shall build it and I will dwell in it. So maybe that's referring to the walls. Ah, is that right, Johnny? No, I don't know. Just is that right? That is that is it true what you just said? Tell me what you just said. Say that again slowly. I said in the in the Posuk, it said uh, the Posuk before the came to us, it said you shall uh, build it and I shall dwell in it. Okay, let's actually, let's have a look what it really says. Yeah. Okay, let's see what it really says. Let me get back to that pasuk. Right, where well, Jeffrey's disappeared, so um, we'll have to do our reading ourselves. And then Vasuli mikdash, and they shall make for me a mikdash v'shachanti b'tocham, and I shall dwell. In them, in them, not in it. Yeah. Hashem does not live in that building. He lives in us. But yeah. it's, a, it's a famous, it's a famous drasha here. The shachanti betocham means Hashem is not confined to those wards. That's actually the exact opposite of what you just said. Okay. That Hashem is not confined to those walls. Hashem is living in us. But tocham amongst them, in their midst. In other words, in the midst of the Jewish people. We can only um, merit Hashem dwelling amongst us if we make all this holy stuff. It's not for him. But the Shechanti B'Tocham shows that we were making the temple, the, the sanctuary, the tabernacle, the Mishkan, not for Hashem to dwell in. We were making it for us. We need it after the uh, the eagle as they have after the golden calf, we needed some kind of vehicle through which we became uh, fitting that Hashem should live amongst us. So, um, so the the vaasuli mikdash is for us. It's not for the Hashem to dwell within the walls. So let's is there go. an implication? Is there an implication there for that? As we haven't got the sanctuary, God will not live within us. 
Um, yes, that would be the implication. How do we get around that? I say they shall make me a sanctuary, then it's not making you a sanctuary. <laughs> okay, so he make we make okay, um, you make him a sanctuary, but it's for us. We do that with our kids, don't we? And and you know, you make something for, for the kid, but it's really it's not for you, for the kid, it's for you. Uh, 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 so um, yes, you're right, Michael. The implication there is well, we haven't got a mikdash, and so Hashem cannot dwell amongst us. And the rabbis were very aware of that when the temples were destroyed. Um, that was a massive problem because they've talked themselves into a bit of a corner uh, by using that drasha of a shachanti betocham, meaning that the mikdash is there so that Hashem will dwell amongst us. No more mikdash, no more beta mikdash, no more Hashem dwelling within us. So they had to, um, they had to get out of that conundrum. And how did they do that? Building shuls. Yes, it was indeed shuls. They replaced the Bet Mikdash with two things, with the shul and with the home, both of which are referred to as Mikdash Me'at, a small Mikdash. In other words, a, a, a minor Bet Mikdash. A shul is referred to as a Mikdash Me'at. The shul is the replacement, the temporary replacement, but the replacement of the Beta Mikdash. The temporary replacement has been going on rather a long time right now. But um, the idea being that uh, in, in, until we have such time as we've got the third Beta Mikdash, the shul takes the place of the Mikdash. Now, if you think about this, think about it just for a second. The Pasuk says, make for me a sanctuary and I will dwell within them. What did that sanctuary do? It wasn't for Hashem. Hashem doesn't need a house. The sanctuary, the tabernacle, the Mishkan, the Beta Mikdash, was what? It was a focus for us, for the Jewish people, to focus our minds, to focus our service, to help us to serve Hashem, okay? And if we then achieve that correct focus, we can uh, understand that there is a, a greater being and that we can serve that greater being. And, and however we did it, and back in the day, they did it through Korbanot. And, you know, we'll come to that, 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 that discussion. We come to it very often, don't we? Will there be Korbanot in the third Beit HaMikdash? Um, you probably know my views on that by now. Uh, we don't need to go into it. So the, the idea is that the Mikdash was for us to focus our thoughts, minds and actions on the service of God, which is exactly what a shul does and is exactly what our ho own homes do. What do we do in a shul is we focus on the service of God. We daven. The davening is in place of the korbanot, in place of the service. It's a replacement for what went on in the Bet Mikdash. So it's very, very clear that the service in the shul, as it evolved, came from the fact that it is a Mikdash Me'at. It's a replacement for the Bet Mikdash. And it had to be so for the reason that Michael said, that because without it, Hashem would not dwell within us. Not because he doesn't want to dwell within us unless we've got a shul. But it's just so much harder. Now, you'll say to me, well, I found it much easier to, to daven properly during COVID when we weren't going to shul and everybody wasn't talking and discussing, you know, this, that and the other uh, and driving you mad in the middle of davening. Um, so you'll say to me, we don't need a shul. And I will say to you, well, that may well be the case on a small level. But as a Jewish people, we certainly do need that focus. If you then, if you did, a, and if you said, well, look, COVID has, has, has proved to us we don't need a shawl. We can do it perfectly well on our own. Um, we, don't, we don't need any of this uh, um, um, shawl business. Uh, we can even do it on Zoom if we want. Um, and I would suggest to you that that might last a year or two, but it would be not very long before we'd all fall away 
and we wouldn't be davening and we, it would all just dis dissipate very, very quickly, in my view. And the fact that we have shuls, we have minyan, we have a service, we have to be together. It is that which makes it last. It's that which keeps it going. And it's that, therefore, which facilitates these two words here, and I shall dwell amongst them. In other words, amongst the people. So, um, so you're right, Michael. Uh, the implication of that pastuk is very, very serious. And therefore, um, along came the development and the uh, um, expansion of the idea of a shul. The home is also called a mikdash me'at because our homes should be also be a focus of the service of God. We, uh, we, we do the mitzvot that we do in the home. We put on mezuzah. Um, we, we light Shabbos candles. Uh, we say brachot. We say birchat amazon, etc., etc. All of these things, we, we do the mitzvah of, of, uh, uh, of uh, procreation in our homes, um, etc. So th this is also the mikdash um, ma'at um, situation, which, which is a replacement for the mikdash. Okay. One further problem. Uh, Hashem said that we've got to construct the mishkan in a certain way. But the, the home and the shul haven't been constructed in the way that God instructed. So therefore, there's a further problem there. OK, so so uh, that's a fair, fair comment. And um, this was very prescriptive. Um, and the whole point of our Gemara, let's go back to our Gemara just to. Uh, um, you don't have to do it the same way. You can alter it. Say that again, Johnny. The Chaim Ta'asu says you, you're building a shul, so you can alter the measurements, etc. <laughs> oh, well, that's not what the, the Gemara says. The Gemara says the opposite. No, the Gemara well. says, the Chaim Ta'asu, Michael's question is a good question, because the Chaim Ta'asu, the Dorot Haba'in, let me get the screen on for you again, with the Gemara. Uh, the Gemara says, the Chaim Ta'asu means over here, the Dorot um, Haba'in. Um, yeah. It's for the future generations. And, and Michael says, well, we don't make every shul's not the same. No, it's not the same, is it? But it does have certain um, similarities. There are certain things yeah. that uh, are the same, like you have an Aaron Kodesh, which if you built the place correctly, uh, which we haven't, uh, is facing Jerusalem. Um, and you have a Bima. Uh, but of course, these things um, develop, don't they? They develop in the different styles. Uh, of the various uh, things. And of course, it is a mikdash ma'at and not a mikdash. Um, so, but I take your point. That's a fair point, Michael. Um, but what we're talking about here uh, is the, mik the better mikdash. We're talking about the city of Jerusalem and the uh, Azara, the courtyards, not being allowed to be expanded. Uh, that we're talking about at the time of the better mikdash, where it was um, prescriptive. Okay, you had to do it in a certain way. Now, Nebuch, for us, we don't have that. And so our Mikdash Ma'at, we've got a bit more leeway. Um, uh, some people have taken the leeway too far. And, you know, you have these sort of rather uh, weird shuls. I, uh, that are some are weird shuls that I've been to. I went to one shul in San Jose, California, where it was, um, it was built like a, like a cinema. It was all in the round. Yeah, you had, uh, it was like a, a, a theater almost with the, the stage in the middle and you were in the, the oh it was really it was very weird uh, it was very aesthetically pleasing uh, and very modern but of course to the to the purist it was very weird um so yeah when we when we get back the next better mcdash we'll have our prescription back again and we will then only be allowed to expand the azara um the courtyard and the jerusalem boundary with the um, Sanhedrin. So, is, can I ask, please? Is there no suggestion that the words Bechenta Ashsu should relate to the following paragraphs, which are very prescriptive and and so and 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 to indicate that this is what how you have to do it? All right. Let's uh, let's go um, again. Let's go again back to the psukim in the uh, parasha. I'll have a look. There it is. <clears throat> okay. I think the answer to your question is in the next word. 
Va'asu. There you've got it again over here. Verse 10. You've got the, another asu. So it's clear that that v'chein ta'asu belongs to previously. If you didn't have that word ba'asu and they shall make, then I think you might have a, a, a point. But I don't... If, if you're going to say that belongs to there, then I'll ask the same question about why do we need another ba'asu? Yeah, you're right. So one way or another, one way or another, that asu at the, in verse 8 refers to the mishkan, the mishkan as a whole. That asu that in verse 10 re refers to the next bits that we're talking about. And this one here is superfluous. And that's what the Gemara is getting itself excited about. OK, so um, let's go back to the Gemara. And we're now going to look um, at the rebuttal uh, of Rava's argument. So just to go back a sec. The Gemara says, how do you know that you need 71 judges? We brought this Vechein Ta'asu, and we thought we were doing very nicely, except that Rava pulled a rabbit out of a hat, a brysa out of his back pocket, and said there's a brysa that, that, that disagrees with your interpretation of Vechein Ta'asu. So now the Gemara says, Shani Hatam. Shani, that means it's different. Modern Hebrew, how do you say different in modern Hebrew? Oh, no. Shone, yeah, shone, different, same word. Shane hatam, over there. Hatam means over there. What's he mean over there? It means you're brighter. Hatam means over there, you're brighter. This is the Gemara answering Rava. He says, you're brighter, Rava, it's different. It, you can't bring a comparison. Why? Because he now brings another verse, um, it, 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 and he says, Da'amakra, the verse, the Pasuk says, and he quotes a verse in um, Sefer Bamidbar, chapter 7, Vayim Shachem Vayekadesh Otam. This is... Well, I'll just show you straight away where it is. Let me take you to it. There it is. Um, it's uh, right at the um, beginning of the laning that we do for, well, when do you think we might do this laning? It's talking about the finishing of the erection of the Mishkan. When might this be the laning for? We are consecrating the Mishkan in this part of the laning. And it was on the day that Moshe finish it, finished erecting the Mishkan. Vayimshach oto. And he uh, anointed it via Kadeshoto, and he made it holy. When might we lane this in the year? Go on, have a guess. Come on, somebody must have a guess, apart from David, who, of course, knows this because he lanes it a million times. You'll kick yourself when I tell you. Chanukah. It's the consecration or the re-consecration of the Bet Mikdash after the Greeks had defiled it. And we re-consecrated all the uh, vessels. What else would you lane except this bit here about sanctifying the vessels with holy oil? So this is from the laning from uh, um, Hanukkah. Uh, but the pasuk that we're interested in, the Gemara quotes, is this first pasuk. It was on the day that Moses finishing erect, finished erecting the Mishkan. He anointed it, sanctified it, and all its vessels and the altar, and all its vessels, and he anointed them and sanctified them. Now, come on. That must hit you in the face. There's a problem with that pasuk, isn't there? 
Repetition. Repetition, yes. What was that game called? That you'd say repetition. repetition, deviation, and hesitation. Yeah, well, just, a minute. just a minute. That's right, just a minute. Uh, Nicholas, what's his name? Nicholas Parsons. Parsons, that's him. Yes, Nicholas Parsons, just a minute. You weren't allowed repetition. Well, there's a plenty of repetition here. We don't allow repetition either, uh, because when there's repetition, we call that superfluous, and the, the, the Gemara has to then teach us something from this superfluity. Um, and there it is. I mean, in all its glory, you can't get much more superfluous than that. It was on the day that Moses finishing it, finished erecting the Mishkan. He anointed it, sanctified it and all its vessels and the altar and all its vessels. And he anointed them and sanctified them. Well, we don't need those last three words there, do we? We don't need and he anointed them and sanctified them because we've just been told it in the line before. So the Gemara jumps on that. Let's go and have a look at the Gemara and see what the Gemara jumps on uh, with that Pasuk. Um, let's get the Gemara back up again. I could do with, actually, maybe I can do that. I've just thought of a way of seeing, of getting them both up at once. Ah, oh, hang on a minute. Let me just try that. Then I won't need to flip back and forth. Oh, that would be good, wouldn't it? Let's try this. No, I don't know if it works. So try this. What can you see now? Can you see the two split? Can you see a split screen? Yes. Ah, it's only taken me about since the beginning of COVID to work that one out. Yeah. Okay. Is it too small for you to see? It is too small for you to see. Okay. All right. We well, it doesn't really help. Can fingers, though, can't we? Sorry? We can expand it by using our fingers to... Uh, yes, that's how you can. Anyway... We'll, we'll, we'll go with it for the moment, just to see how it goes. If you don't like it, then I'll go back to flicking back and forth. But right now, we've got them both on here. So I'm over here, Shani Hatam. It's different over there, says the Gemara. Um, it, and he quotes this Pasuk, Otam. And he anointed them and sanctified them. And the Gemara uh, takes issue, actually, not with the whole uh, uh, three words, which I would take issue on. It takes issue only on the word, or at least stresses the word otam. What does otam mean? Them. Otam means them. What's he referring to? The vessels that Moshe anointed. So says the Gemara, Otam bimeshicha, it was them, i.e. those vessels of the first mikdash, the first um, mishkan, that were uh, anointed. Velo ledorot bimeshicha, and not a requirement of future generations for them to be anointed. Okay. So, by saying them, he anointed them and sanctified them. The repetition and the use of the word them, the stressing of them, the Gemara uses to show that it was them and only them that required anointing. So, if that's the case, we don't need your brighter to tell us that, because we've got a pass-up, thank you very much. Um, so uh, that's the... Uh, so that, that's... Work, that works very well, really, and it does. he doesn't need to go into the uh, words um, sanctified and anointed, because you can't use the word them without saying sanctified them and anointed them. Yeah, so I, that's absolutely right. Simply... And in, but, but, but more than that, Julia, even more than that, the Gemara points out that um, you can use the words sanctify and anoint without using the word otam. The fact that it says otam is stressing them. Them, and I'm putting in brackets, and only them, and not future generations. So let's go back to the full screen now. There you go. Can you see the full screen now? Does that work? Yes. 
Yeah. See, I've learned a new trick today. That's good. All right. So says uh, let's, the Steinsaus translates it nicely. The verse emphasizes that he sanctified them. And from this, it is inferred that only those utensils need sanctification by anointment. But for future generations, there is not a requirement of sanctification by its anointment. OK, so we now um, carry on and we say, so therefore, therefore, instead, we will say the following. Otam bimshicha, oladorot i bimshicha i bavuda, and therefore they needed a, a, a anointment. But for future generations, you could do it either by anointment brackets if you happen to be fortunate enough to have some oil to anoint it with, or by usage. In other words, by just getting on and using it brackets in case you don't have any oil to anoint with it's a practical pragmatic solution okay um so um so then we just uh, get another pass up to help us out here um to say uh that to, to, to emphasize that the usage of the vessels is uh good enough to get them sanctified and um, we that Rav Papa comes along and gives us a scriptural support for that practical halacha. And he quotes another uh, pasuk, this time in uh, uh, Bamidbar 412. There it is. Um, and he says here, this is this is um, um, again talking about the Mishkan. And um, they shall take the Valakhu et kol klea sharet, and they shall take all the vessels of service. Sharet is service. What word do you know from there? Sharetim. Sharetim, yes, services. Um, so all the vessels of service, asher yisharetu bum, which they would use. Well, if they're vessels of service, then of course you're going to use them for service. That's superfluous. Ashe Yisharatu Vam is not needed. It's not needed. Um, I will just um, finish the Pasuk, not that it's relevant to us, but just because it's got my favorite word in there. Um, Ashe Yisharatu Vam Bakodesh, which are used in uh, holiness. Venat nu, and you shall place them, El Beged Techelet, on a garment of techelet okay and then the chisua tamba mixei or and you have to cover them with a a, a, a leather a, a leather covering etc but the important bit for our mishnah is these words ashe yishartu bamba kodesh which you will agree we don't need it's superfluous so let's go back to the gemara this is much better the way i've got it now i don't have to start flicking back and forth um um, so Rav Papa says, Asher Yesharatu Bamba Kodesh, Hakatuv Tela'an B'Sheirut. The verse Tela'an hangs it on, de makes it dependent on. Um, talui means dependent on. It also means um, to hang on. Where do you know that from, Johnny? Hanging. Uh, no, I know the word. I know it's hanging. I don't know where I know it from. Yes, yeah, you do. Vaaseret b'nei somebody or other talu al ha'et and the ten yeah, sons of Aman. Aman, that's right. Hello, yeah. Talu al ha'et. They were hung on the yeah. gallows. Okay, so it means hung. So the verse. Tala'an um, hangs the usage, um, uh, the holiness on the usage. So the verse renders it dependent upon service, meaning that the service is what sanctifies them. Okay, fine, says the Gemara. I'm very happy now, aren't I? Except I'm not, because the Gemara now says, well, okay. You've just told me a whole nice drosher over here about the word otam. 
And now you're telling me that there's a different Pasuk that tells me that. Well, what am I going to do with that Otam then? It's still superfluous. And that is what we will do next week, please God. We were in the middle of a ping pong match here. Um, and it's very interesting. So uh, this is, uh, let's just summarize what we did today. We, um, we showed uh, that Moshe, we, again, we showed that Moshe and the Sanhedrin are equivalent to one another. We had this superfluous expression, Bechein Ta'asu, which referred to future generations. Um, and, and, and then we asked a question saying, well, hang on a minute. There wasn't equality in the Mishkan and future generations across the board because we've got a brisa that Rava brought that says the future generations don't need anoint, anointment. And we said, well, practically, they might not have any oil, and so you'd be in trouble, and that's why. But then we brought actually a, 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 a proof, a, strict, a, a scriptural proof from the word otam, meaning them, meaning them and only them. The Mishkan was the only vessels that needed anointment. And then the Gemara says, well, well that's very nice, but I've got a posse that tells me that directly. I share Yeshara to Bamba Kodesh. Um, so why do I need the word Otam? And so we're now still in the middle of an argument. So please, God, next week we will continue uh, this uh, discussion about the arguments. Um, and you can see by this whole back and forth that we've done today how um, carefully uh, they looked at these words uh, that we just let go by, pass by our eyes and don't even think about. And that's why the, the learning of Gemara is so illuminating, um, because it's it's an uh, what's the word? It's an insight into the the way the rabbis looked at the Torah and the depth to which they looked at it. And in some of them, like if you look at the, the shir that we did two weeks ago, I wasn't all that impressed with one of their arguments. I thought it was a bit of a tenuous link, but. Even the tenuous link is, comes from a deep insight. Um, and, and that's the beauty of the Gemara. You can say, well, eh, OK, that's a great insight. And we've said that Julia really liked today's uh, um, derivation. She said, yeah, that sits very nicely. And sometimes you think, eh, that, you know, that's a bit of a dre. Um, but I mean, that's the beauty of learning Gemara. OK, um, any comments on today's Shior? You certainly have to illuminate it, Johnny. Thank you very much. You do. You do. Today was excellent. Fabulous. Indeed. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, we will reconvene hopefully next week. Everybody who needs a Rafua Shalema should have a Rafua Shalema. Everybody who needs something else should have whatever they need in a positive manner. Um, so we will see you all next week, please, God. Thanks very much indeed. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Johnny. Thank you, Johnny.